Here's Citroen's take on the city car state of the art, the second generation C1. This French brand has always been rather good at very compact, efficient little models. Their iconic 2CV goes back to the 40s, while more recent small runabouts like the Saxo and the first generation C3 still have loyal owners. People who are probably going to take very easily to this, today's modern interpretation of Citroen's city car chic. Small where it matters and big where it counts, this is claimed to be a runabout perfectly adapted to economical life on the urban street. The original version of Citroen C1 used to be an easy car to recommend to the right kind of buyer. People like me would point customers towards it who simply wanted a really cheap way to get mobile. Theoretically, there were less expensive city car options, but in practice, Citroen's dealer deals often meant that a first generation C1 was the next step up from a moped when it came to affordable running costs. So, what of this Mark II model? Well, as you can see, it's got uh, a bit more about it in every sense, actually. The looks make more of a statement. There's now a choice of petrol engines and of body styles too, with the introduction of a canvas-roofed Airscape variant. All versions are a little bigger inside and a lot more up-to-date in terms of technology, safety and equipment. In other words, it was clear from the moment we first saw it in the spring of 2014 that the Citroen had evolved. That's the good news for the company. The tougher part of the brand's C1 assignment comes in differentiating this car from the two rival models that, beneath their different aesthetics, share pretty much exactly the same design. This city runabout, you see, like its predecessor, has been developed as a joint venture with Peugeot and Toyota. The reasons why you might buy one in preference to Toyota's rather self-consciously funky iGo model might come down to price, the affordable availability of that open roof option, and the fact that the Japanese brand's contender doesn't offer a pokier petrol engine. It's harder though to differentiate this car from a rival Peugeot 108, unless you're one of those who appreciates this C1's more youthful, in-your-face styling. That may well also help this Citroen in dealing with extremely tough competitors elsewhere in the city car segment. Cars like Fiat's Panda, Hyundai's i10, Vauxhall's Viva, Renault's Twingo, and the various models derived from Volkswagen's Up. Mind you, to take on that little lot, more concrete accomplishments will be needed. Can this C1 offer them? Let's find out. The C1 driving proposition has always been pretty straightforward. It's a city car that's small, manoeuvrable, easy to see out of, and as you realise very early on, jinking around town, very simple to operate. It's grown up a bit though in second generation guys. Like many of the latest urban runabouts, the designers behind this one realised that it might not always be used in the city. So, uh, refinement's been improved and pokier engine options added. In fact, the two issues are here linked. Citroen's smallest hatch now offers a couple of petrol-powered three-cylinder choices, with an 82-brake horsepower BTI unit from the C3 Super Mini arriving to join an improved version of the older 68-brake horsepower one-litre unit. Now that one litre engine is unashamedly aimed at urban folk and might become a little orally wearing if you were to use it over an extended motorway trip. If such a journey might be an occasional possibility, the 1.2 litre engine option, not incidentally available on this car's Toyota iGo design stablemate, would be a better choice. In fact, if you'll be doing almost any kind of regular open road motoring, then I'd say that the 1.2 litre variant will probably be a better bet, because overtaking is so much easier. 
the one litre model takes a yawning 29.8 seconds to accelerate from 50 to 70 miles an hour in its top fifth gear. In the 1.2, the same increment occupies just 15.9 seconds. Enough said. I suggest that this stat tells you a lot more than the usual 0 to 62 mile an hour reading, but for the sake of completeness, I'll give you that too. The one litre model takes either 14.3 or 14.6 seconds, depending on whether its engine has stop and start fitted. The 1.2 litre model that I'm trying here manages the same benchmark in 11 seconds. Having said all of that, there are a huge number of buyers in this segment who will only be using their cars on short shopping trips. People who will probably have access to another vehicle for longer journeys. Now, for these folk, the 1 litre VTI 68 version of this C1 will probably be quite sufficient. As I mentioned earlier, this Toyota engineered 998cc unit has been improved. The specific changes, including a higher compression ratio, an improved combustion chamber design, and use of a low friction timing chain. All of these things combining not only to improve efficiency, but also to boost power slightly over the previous first generation C1 model, which only came with the earlier version of this engine. If you were familiar with that car, then you should find this one to be a touch more drivable. For a start, in the old C1, you really needed to wind some revs onto the clock in order to get anywhere, which had a marked effect on your fuel consumption. In this car, nearly all of its 95 newton meters of pulling power is available right down low in the rev range, from as little as 2000 RPM. Now, that means that you won't need to rev the thing to death in order to get it going. Though, if you do, the 998cc unit sounds playful. It's normally aspirated note filling the cabin with a characterful three-cylinder thrum. Now, this also has the advantage of making the car feel peppier than it actually is. Once you've covered a few miles, the first thing you'll probably notice is just how light most of the controls are, especially the steering and the clutch. Now, the exception to this is the gear change, which needs more of a firm shove than you'd expect from a car designed with urban driving in mind. If that's an issue, then you might well be tempted by the optional automatic ETG gearbox that's potentially controllable via a set of steering wheel gear shift paddles that I doubt too many potential owners will bother with. Now I can see many older folk also scratching their heads wondering about the throttle blipping downshifts that uh, the ETG transmission throws in. The auto variant will certainly suit urban bound folk, people who'll appreciate the light steering and a curb to curb 10 meter turning circle so tight that even if you spot a parking space on the other side of the road, you may be able to throw a quick U-turn to snaffle it. When reversing into a narrow bay, it's almost comical how little car there is behind the rear seats. And it's worth remembering that you can afford to leave yourself some breathing room at the back. Parking like this is especially easy thanks to the light power steering that'll twirl you easily into the smallest slot. In fact, the only issue in low speed manoeuvring lies with rear wheel arches wide enough to be a touch vulnerable if you don't keep your wits about you. Still, on top variants like this one fitted with the multimedia system standard reverse parking camera, well, even that shouldn't be too much of a problem. These big door mirrors should help too. And handling? Well, the development team behind this car say that they benchmarked the Ford Ka in this respect, one of the results of which was that the steering was made 14% more direct than that of the old C1. Now, true enough, it does provide more fingertip feedback than before. The brakes also feel well up to spec, despite this Citroen doing without rear discs and opting for a cheaper rear drum setup instead. 
Other incremental dynamic improvements include retuned springs and dampers, plus a lighter rear torsion beam. That's one of the things contributing to a 60 kilogram weight saving over this model's predecessor. The result is a slightly more agile, chuckable city runabout that can now be driven with a bit more vigour, but it still isn't the driver's choice in this segment, though that's something that few likely buyers will care very much about. Pitch into a corner and you get the predictable helping of body roll and tyre squeal that you'd expect from this kind of car. Stick with it though and this C1 can nevertheless be pretty good fun to pedal along. It might perhaps have been sharper in this respect had not Citroen's engineers, rightly, been so mindful of the need to preserve a decent standard of ride quality. Because they had been, this car handles road humps and potholes very well. It's that bit better in this respect than before. In fact, as you probably gathered by now, almost everything about this C1 is that bit better than was the case with the old one. No radical steps have been taken. The car just feels that bit more sophisticated and grown up. And as I've been suggesting, you may even feel confident enough to take it on the odd longer trip. In this 1.2 litre guise, it's certainly able to keep up with the cut and thrust of motorway driving, although you might need the odd down change to keep the little engine on the boil. Top speed is pegged at around about the 100 mile an hour mark, which ensures that cruising speeds are not an issue. Small where it matters, big where it counts. That's the idea here. At just 3.46 metres long, this little hatch is certainly small, still the most compact model in the Citroen range, whether you choose it with three or with five doors. In the brand's own words, this car is supposed to deliver an upbeat response to today's urban mobility requirements. The upbeat bit is delivered here with this unusual two-part headlamp signature. Together with these integrated LED daytime running lights, this aims to create a smiley front-end gaze that hopes to emphasise what the brand sees as this car's cheerful design and strong character. It works better in the metal than it does through the lens and differentiates this C1 from its Peugeot and Toyota design stablemates far more distinctly than was the case with the first generation model. It looks a bit more upmarket too, especially if you upgrade the 14-inch wheels to the larger 15-inch diamond-tipped alloys as here, and add touches like chromed or body-coloured mirrors and door handles. Many customers will doubtless also like the option the Airscape version of this car offers of a full-length retractable fabric folding roof, creating that cabriolet feeling without the cost or buffeting associated with a fully-fledged convertible. It's a lovely touch, but even this standard fixed top version has plenty of those. Take these lovely DS3 style 3D tail lamps, for example. They complete a more cleanly styled tailgate topped off by an integrated roof spoiler that hides the external hinges that used to look so ugly on the old C1 model. I say tailgate, in reality this lifting rear section is little more than a deeply sculpted hinged back window, doubtless there to reduce the cost of manufacturing, but from an ownership perspective a feature I've never liked. Unlike a proper conventional lifting rear hatch, this opening glass panel doesn't fully cut into the bumper, so there's quite a lofty lip over which you've to lift in your shopping, even if the height of this has been reduced by 20 millimetres in comparison to this model's predecessor. The Volkswagen Up, along with its Skoda and Seat stablemates, suffers from the same thing for the same reason. Enough about access, what about actual luggage space, the lack of which put so many people off the previous generation version of this car? The news that this C1 is 40mm longer than its predecessor might lead you to hope for more in this area, but examine the small print and you'll find that all of this extra length has been added to the front end to meet modern safety impact legislation.
In fact, this car's platform is pretty much the same as it was before, which will disappoint previous Citroen City Car buyers wanting to trade up to a model with the kind of generous 250-litre style body space that you get in a rival Volkswagen Up or high end i10. There's nothing like that on offer here. Still, on the positive side, cargo room has usefully risen from the feeble 139 litre space that you used to get in a C1 to a much more acceptable 196 litre capacity here. Easily enough for a couple of small suitcases or a set of golf clubs. Curiously, that's nearly 30 litres more than a supposedly identical Toyota Igo. Not that luggage space is necessarily the be-all and the end-all for customers in this class. Most of them rarely use the rear bench in their cars and therefore have no issue in regularly pushing the 50-50 split seats forward to extend the space available. Now in this case, though the load area created has quite a step in it and the folded seats, as you can see, don't lie completely flat, you do get a very decent 780 litre capacity. If you need a greater capacity than that for your weekly shop, it might well be time to change your lifestyle rather than your car. If you are using the back seat, then you won't be expecting it to be very spacious, given that this car is just still 3.4 metres in length. It isn't. Still, with a bit of cooperation from those ahead of them, two adults could manage without too much grousing on short to medium length trips, even if they were six footers. I might even think of cramming my three kids in this uh, section on this bench, were it not for the fact that rather annoyingly, there are still only two belts provided. Unfortunately, you can't get a third belt as an option. Fiat offers that with its rival Panda model. Why not here? If you do have kids, then I'd definitely go for the five-door model. I've tried transporting my trio in the past with a three-door version of this kind of Citroen, and it didn't take too long for the front seat backs to start looking very scuffed and scruffy as the children piled in and out. When it came to this car, my lot didn't mind the restricted legroom, but they did object to a couple of features that you find on a lot of small city cars. The lack of proper wind-up rear windows, you only get this angled panel, and the slight claustrophobia engendered by the upwardly sweeping waistline of this rear door. Up front, it's reasonably easy to get comfortable, provided you've avoided an entry-level variant without seat height adjustment. Something that's important to have because the steering wheel adjusts only up and down, not in and out. Settle in, then start to look around, and if you've tried a few current city car models, you might conclude that the quality of the trim, though a step up from what was provided previously, isn't quite of the standard you'd find in, say, a Volkswagen Up. Still, the design is more interesting, which takes your mind off the fact. And you can make it more interesting still for the instrument panel, the centre console, the air vents nearest the driver's door window, the gear shift knob and the gear lever surround can all be easily changed to a colour of your choosing, even after years of ownership. The wide dashboard's nice, trimmed in this cool matte finish and framed by refreshingly slim A-pillars that aid visibility. And talking of visibility, if you've chosen a version of this C1 with the optional Airscape fabric folding roof, you'll need to accept the fact that with it open in bright sunlight, a number of the interior dials and displays will be a bit difficult to read. Now, it'll also be pretty difficult to converse with fellow passengers at higher cruising speeds too, despite the roof system's aeroacoustic deflector. Still, we all have to pay for our pleasures, don't we? Fortunately, the inside of a C1 is quite a pleasurable place to be, and quite practical too. There are two cup holders, plus uh, another one behind the handbrake here and a good sized glove box that incorporates a bottle holder. There are practical storage options for your mobile phone and loose change. 
and door bins big enough to hold a 500 millilitre bottle of water. Ahead of you at the wheel lie a mass of different shaped elements of trim. The round speedometer pod with its LCD centre display is flanked by an optional vertically stacked rev counter that as you accelerate lights up like an 80s Atari video game. Even more curiously styled is the trapezoidally shaped central panel that holds the 7 inch infotainment colour display that Citroen provides to dominate the centre of the dash on all but the entry level model. This system, the touch drive interface mirror screen, really adds another dimension to the C1 and to be honest I'd hesitate to buy one without it. Now, as the name suggests, it's operated using a fully integrated touchscreen and can include a uh, rear view camera on plusher models like this one. Wherever it's fitted, you get a DAB radio uh, along with vehicle and journey information and uh, Bluetooth connectivity uh, that includes the sending and the receiving of texts. What you don't get, rather astonishingly in this day and age, is even the option of adding satellite navigation to this setup, something Toyota offers on their iGo. In contrast, Citroen, like Peugeot, relies on the fact that owners will be able to connect their smartphones into this system and get route guidance that way. I'd suggest that to be a mistake. Not everyone is technically savvy enough to do that, especially not more mature buyers. Still, at least the whole process of smartphone linking is as simple as it can be here, thanks to a clever so-called mirror link function that duplicates the home screen of your handset onto the display for easier acclimatization. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with absolutely all smartphone models, and when you do link in your handset, uh, you'll have to get used to the fact that the screen goes blank when your phone reverts to its sleep mode. Still, get familiar with the whole process and as you change into a world where you can do things like use Google Map navigation, read your messages or play web stream music, you'll wonder how you ever manage without it. Though in theory C1 motoring starts at just over £8,000, that only gets you a very basic entry level model that can't be ordered with five doors and doesn't have any of the personalisation options and interior sophistication that really make this Citroen what it is. Better then to think instead in terms of this car costing you from around £9,500 with a price span ranging up to around £12,000. Now that's the kind of price bracket able to deliver the kind of C1 you'd be able to tailor to your own particular preferences. There's a £400 premium to go from a three-door body style to this five-door model and either way an optional £850 premium to pay if you want to have the Airscape fabric folding roof fitted. This comes in three colours, black, grey and sunrise red. As for specs, well, it's easier to mix and match what you want in the C1 lineup than it is in the Peugeot 108 range, or indeed with a Toyota Higo. Urban bound folk wanting the convenience of the ETG semi automatic gearbox will be pleased that they'll only have to find another £250 for it on top of the cost of their chosen model. Though they might be less pleased by the news that it can only be ordered with the feebler 1 litre engine. Before you commit to purchase though, you'll be wanting to know just how strong a value proposition this car's pricing represents in its class. After all, in this sector of the market, more than any other, buyers want to feel like they're getting a lot for their money by the standards of the segment. Time to decide whether that's the case here. In terms of the competition, the first alternatives to this C1 that you might want to consider will probably be the two models that share its basic design and roll from the same Czech factory, Peugeot's 108 and Toyota's iGo. The Peugeot costs exactly the same as this Citroen, but for a Toyota iGo, you'll need to find a model-for-model -model premium of around £300, and there isn't the option of this Pokia 1.2-litre engine. 
To be honest, ultimately, once dealer deals are taken into account, you'll probably find that there's not a lot in it between any of these three cars when it comes to price. So it really comes down to which design interpretation you prefer. Now, whatever your choice from the trio, if you're a savvy buyer, you'll be pitching it up against the city car segment's other key single multi-branded design. The one that really represents its toughest competition. This is the model that sector buyers know either as a Volkswagen Up, a Skoda Citigo, or a Seat Me. Now, at first glance, equivalent base one litre versions of these three cars look similarly priced to the Citroen, but as ever, it pays to look at the small print. To match this C1's running costs, you have to get the Volkswagen, the Skoda and the Seat in their extra cost eco guises, respectively the UP Blue Motion Technology, the Citigo Green Tech and the Mi Ecomotive. And that'll see you paying anywhere between £1,100 and £1,700 more than you would for this Citroen. It's the same story if you go for another popular city car alternative, Hyundai's i10. The base version price matches itself quite closely to the Citroen, but to get C1 star running costs, you actually have to pay another £1,300 more for the more efficient Blue Drive model. Ouch! In fact, to get a rival city car model that in standard form can get closer to the efficiency figures of this Citroen, you've to cast your net further afield. Maybe towards Suzuki's Alto, the base version of which would save you around £1,000 over this car but feels really cheap. Um, no, a close arrival, I think, is Kia's Picanto, which in base one litre form gets within a few percentage points of this car's fuel and CO2 returns and looks good value at around £8,000. Are there other city car options? Not that many. Vauxhall's Viva and Renault's Twingo are both worth a look, but will probably work out to be more expensive. And list prices suggest that a three-door only Ford KA, a three-door only Fiat 500, and a five-door only Fiat Panda certainly will, despite the fact that the old tech 1.2 litre engines the affordable versions have to have could cost you up to 20% more to run. Also around 20% less efficient is Dacia's five-door only Sandero 0.9 litre TCE, though at least that's cheaper and more spacious in compensation. Before leaving talk of competitors, though, I need to say a word or two about one of the key options that really would sell me on this design, the Escape fabric folding roof that around 20% of buyers will choose. No, a C1 equipped with this wouldn't feel quite the same as a proper convertible. But then you wouldn't get the running cost downsides associated with one of those either, or the buffeting at speed. Other manufacturers have been offering this kind of concertinering fabric folding top for some time. Fiat on their 500 and Citroen themselves on their DS3. But while in those cases buyers would need to find around £3,000 for this feature, the mere £850 you'll have to pay to get it on this C1 seems quite a bargain. The cheapest, most basic open-topped Fiat 500C is well over £13,000. The least expensive Citroen C1 Escape model is nearly £3,000 less than that. Makes you think, doesn't it? So let's say you've done your homework, looked at all the different C1 fixed and fabric top model options and decided that the Citroen is indeed what you want. What can you expect for your money? Well, it's a bit disappointing to find that the entry-level version does without a 50-50 split-folding rear seat and a rev counter, nor can it be ordered with any of the option or customization packs that are restricted to plusher variants like this one. Still in base touch spec, you do get high-tech projector headlamps with LED tracer lights, LED daytime running lights, uh, an integrated rear spoiler, uh, electric front windows, a 12-volt power socket, remote central locking, aux in and USB connectivity, and an RDS stereo with steering column mounted controls. But hey, hardly any of the C1s sold here will be base spec cars. Your dealer will be wanting you to start your search on the second rung of the trim ladder, feel. 
the point at which you can really start to specify your car the way you want it, with the personalization options and the chance to pay extra for key features like five doors, the escape fabric folding roof, the ETG auto transmission I mentioned earlier, and perhaps most importantly, the multimedia system with its integrated DAB radio and Bluetooth phone connectivity. At the feel trim level, there's also air conditioning, driver's seat height adjustment, a multifunction steering wheel and larger 15-inch wheels. As usual though, the real niceties, things like alloy wheels, auto headlights, front fog lamps, a reverse parking camera and climate control are limited to top spec versions like this flare variant. Key items rare to find in this class, either fitted at the top of the range or available as options, include full leather upholstery and keyless entry with push-button start. I'd also want to pay the extra for a space saver rear wheel rather than the fiddly puncher repair kit offered as standard. Most buyers though will probably go shopping for a mid-range variant, then start the personalization process. A two-tone paint finish, perhaps, with the colours split along the bodywork waistline. Or maybe you'd like to make a change inside, where there's a choice of shades for the central instrument panel, the centre console, the air vents, the gear shift knob and the gear lever surround. To try and make the personalisation process easier, your dealer will offer you a range of key optional packs for this car. The exterior ones are dubbed Chrome and Urban, with the cabin packs titled White and Sunrise Red. Now, these are easy ways for more extrovert buyers to add a bit of extra colour and class. Paying extra for a bit of C1 tinsel is fair enough, but having to fork out more to get a decent safety spec is less acceptable. The old C1 predecessor to this car did without safety basics like ESP stability control, side airbags and Isofix child seat fastenings, which really was unacceptable. Fortunately, this time round, Citroen has put things right. All models get the same complete safety equipment tally, running to twin front, side and curtain airbags, stability control, ABS and Isofix child seat fastenings. There's even a tyre pressure warning system, a hill start assist control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. And further up the range, a speed limiter on manual models to help safeguard your licence in urban areas. Even if it is being targeted at well-heeled downsizers or those families looking for an easy-to-use second or third car, the C1 can't afford to be off the pace in terms of economy and emissions, nor is it. Citroen also proudly boasts that every model in the range comes in at less than 100 grams per kilometre of carbon dioxide emissions, so there'll be no annual road tax to pay. That even applies to the Pokia 1.2 litre VTI variant with its lustier 82 brake horsepower power plant. This manages 65.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 99 grams per kilometre of CO2. If you really want to maximise your motoring returns though, you'll need to look at the feebler 1 litre VTI 68 version, also three cylinders in size, throbbing, characterful unit that's fundamentally the same as that used in the old C1 model but has been re-engineered for this, its replacement, with a higher compression ratio, a lower friction timing chain and a cylinder head with built-in exhaust manifold to help save weight. Now, as a result of all of this, combined cycle fuel economy has improved by just over 3 miles to the gallon to 68.9 miles to the gallon. Couple that frugality with a 35 litre fuel tank and you have a vehicle with a range of over 530 miles, which given typically small city car annual mileages will probably mean that you won't get on first name terms with the stuff in your local filling station. CO2 emissions, meanwhile, are 4 grams per kilometre better, now rated at 95 grams per kilometre. Though, of course, this car's Toyota Igo and Peugeot 108 design stablemates can match these figures, 
no other rival city car can, unless it's purchased in an extra cost eco-minded guise. So, for example, if you buy a standard one litre Volkswagen Up, say at me, Skoda Citigo or Hyundai i10, your running costs will be 10 to 15% higher, unless you're prepared to find anything between 800 to 1500 pounds more at point of purchase for an eco-branded version respectively the UP Blue Motion Technology, the Me Ecomotive, the Citigo Green Tech, and the i10 Blue Drive. It always pays to read the small print, doesn't it? Still, at least these rivals can be frugal. The least powerful petrol engine you'll find matched up against a 1 litre C1 in a Ford Ka, a Fiat Panda or a Fiat 500 will take you 10 to 15 fewer miles on every gallon and will chug out 20 to 25 grams per kilometre more of CO2. Now I should also point out that this C1 model's cost of ownership superiority increases if you order your one litre variant with the extra cost stop and start system fitted, in which form it's badged SNS. You'll probably be familiar with the concept of stop and start by now, a setup that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. And it makes quite a difference to your running costs. Get yourself an SNS VTI 68 1 litre C1 and your combined cycle fuel economy will improve to 74.3 miles to the gallon and your CO2 emissions will make better reading at a green minded 88 grams per kilometre of CO2. That's the kind of figure you might expect only a diesel engine to provide but which you can achieve here with lower cost green pump fuel. Plus, if you're a company car driver, you'll save yourself the usual 3% diesel tax surcharge too. If we'd been talking about this car's first generation C1 predecessor, it's at this point that I'd have cautioned you against opting for the extra cost EGS automatic version with its much higher running costs. Now this time round, there's not such a penalty for ignoring the manual model option. In fact, the revised ETG Auto uh, version, it's only available with the one litre engine, carries with it hardly any penalty at all, combined cycle fuel consumption dropping only slightly to 67.3 miles to the gallon, and CO2 emissions now making it below the key 100 grams per kilometre of CO2 barrier to 97 grams per kilometre. Whichever version you choose, you can keep an eye on your fuel consumption progress via the useful graphs provided in the multimedia system. What else? Well, there's no diesel option, of course. I say of course because the figures show that 90% of city car buyers historically haven't wanted to pay the premium for fueling from the black pump, and there seems no prospect of that attitude changing very soon. And residual values? Well, they may not be quite as strong as those commanded by a Volkswagen Up, but once you've had a chat with your friendly Citroen dealer, you'll probably end up paying less for a C1, which will sort that out anyway. Insurance groupings range from 6E to 11E. That's a little dearer than the newest crop of rivals, but not by enough to be significant. It still means that the C1 makes a great choice for newly qualified or younger drivers looking for their first car. Here it'll probably help that the body panels are designed to pop straight off, which makes accident damage cheap and easy to fix. And talking of maintenance, it would be good if Citroen, and Peugeot for that matter, felt able to match the 5 year 100,000 mile cover that Toyota offers on the iGo. Here you merely get the usual 3 year 60,000 mile Citroen package. Still, on the plus side, you'll find that most spares are inexpensive as you have the choice to source the majority of mechanical items from a Toyota or a Peugeot outlet as well as from a Citroen dealership. There's also three years uh, of warranty against rust and 12 years of anti-corrosion protection. It'll be interesting to see how this C1 sells. In contrast to its design stablemates, it's not as aggressively youthful as a Toyota Igo or as maturely targeted as a Peugeot 108. 
Mind you, that may be quite a clever approach to take, given that many buyers might feel uncomfortable with either of these two extremes. Or perhaps they may be encouraged to feel that way by the more aggressive approach to pricing that Citroen dealers inevitably tend to take. Unlike its predecessor though, this car deserves to sell on more than just price. It's still not as spacious as best-in-class rivals, but in most other respects, the C1 is now as good as, if not better than, the class standard. You'll certainly struggle to find a city car that's cleverer or more efficient. Overall, it's true that there are still more sophisticated choices you could make in this segment, but there's a time and a place for sophistication, and I can imagine many buyers in the market's smaller sector being prepared to look past issues of practicality and refinement, being persuaded instead by this little Citroen's sheer value and joie de vivre. Those are the things you want in a city car, but that's not all you want. With this second generation C1, Citroen now seems to understand this. The result is a much better proposition and a much better car.